Good morning, everyone. Well, actually, it's afternoon here in uh, Arizona where we don't honor or respect uh, or get a glass of water for uh, daylight savings time. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, uh, uh, I just been very busy. Uh, I, sometimes people get upset that I don't post a video every day and I'm like, I don't, I don't have that kind of time. And then of course I know that's a lie because it only takes five or 10 minutes to do a video for you guys. But, um, I just, uh, I've been going through a lot of stuff with, uh, Sherry and also, um, we're coming up on being able to, uh, submit a letter to a judge to, to get visitation back with Everly, my niece. And, uh, I, I think a lot about that and, and what to put in the letter and, cause I certainly don't want to play their game. Uh, when I say they, I'm talking about Lauren, uh, but it's not just Lauren. Lauren is a representative of the, of my wife's whole family, which is, uh, her sisters, her dad, her stepmom. And, uh, one of the things that I thought about this morning, I was just pulling some weeds and I just kind of patrol the, the yard and. And I like I like pulling weeds. <laughs> I think I think it's the the most wonderful thing because it gives me time to just think and just uh, um, not really have to worry about you know will this subwoofer perform? Will this client be happy? You know that sort of stuff. So, but um, I'm pulling weeds and I'm thinking about Lauren and and um, what I realized was that it it seems like. And I, I realize it's not personal, but many people like my niece are trying to tell me something, but they don't have the courage uh, or maybe even the, the words, excuse me, to articulate what they really mean and want, right? Because many people don't know what they want. They're angry, but they don't know what they want. And I've, I've been in that boat too. So I... Um, but so I went in and asked Sherry, I, I asked my wife, I said, you know, what, what is it that I'm missing? What is it that I'm, that you're trying to tell me that I'm not listening to? And she kind of chuckled and she says, well, it's social cues. So one of the things they say about sociopaths is that they don't, they, uh, they don't pick up on social cues. And, and I said, well, no, I'm not a sociopath. You know, I, I sometimes act like it and I don't mind wearing that badge of honor in order to intimidate or scare somebody. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm not a sociopath because I do hear the social cues. I just don't think they're important and I, I and I don't give them any, uh, lip service. I don't give them any, you know, respect that they want. So when, when my father-in-law or my mother-in-law, you know, just sort of is disappointed in me, I'm like, that's your problem, <laughs> you know? And, um, the other night with the police, um, uh, my wife was, uh, she, she admitted that she was kind of impressed that I was not intimidated by police. And uh, uh, shout out to Redman for saying that, uh, you know, everybody says they're not scared to die until they're scared to die. And, and you know, I, I, I honor your reality and I honor m many people's reality. Uh, the, the problem for me is that I, you know, I grew up abused. My both parents abused me emotionally and uh, um, sometimes physically. And uh, I just, I did, as a policy, it's not a, you know, it's not a rule, but as a policy, I, I do my best to not allow anyone to abuse me. And, you know, and then, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, I joined the Air Force, that, which all, that's all they do is all they do is, is um, make your butthole larger. So... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and that's to, that's to more readily let you know who's in charge. And, um, I think it's a very, um, it's so, it really, it's such a short, it shorts them on true integrity and, and true respect, which is what they, which everyone truly wants. Uh, some people though abuse their authority and use, uh, either the threat of violence or, or physical or actual violence in order to achieve the results that they say they want. So going back to the police, 
the other night when I was uh, trolling uh, that uh, that cop that was short and chubby and with the neck beard and everything, I, you know, I I want to apologize to you uh, if you're if you're watching this video or if one of your brothers in arms are uh, watching this and and know who I'm talking about. I do want to apologize to you, and I and I I wish that I would have gotten your name, so that I could apologize to you personally. And and what I realized was, what I wish I said instead of trolling you, what I what I really wish I would have said was that I'm upset with your behavior because number one, you're a professional and you're getting paid to do this, and you act like you're the authority of this, which, you know, by all means, the the police should be the authority on violence. Right. Because when they inflict it, there's there's no consequences for them. But if you inflict it on them, oh, boy, are there consequences. And uh, but what I would what I wish I would have said was that the problem that I have with officers abusing their authority and immediately going to violence is that it undermines their authority. And it, it's not just their individual authority right of them being in person in front of me and and uh uh you know whatever making me sit on the curb or whatever it is um what it it really just it it lessens the legitimacy of all police to be the authority so you know and and i i've i've had this ever since i was a kid you know my dad would feed me some bullshit and i didn't have any really other uh, any other options my my mom too my mom would feed me some bullshit and she, the problem is that she knew I didn't know any better and that I, I, I didn't really have any other choices. So I'd end up doing what she said, even though it was a lie. And, uh, and then of course, later I find out that she betrays me and then she's like, you know, she's, she's jaded. She's like, uh, welcome to my world. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, welcome to the world in general where everyone lies and everyone is corrupt and and it, and that is not true that is absolutely not true and it doesn't have to be true and i think that's the fight that i'm fighting in my my own life and with with everybody here that's that's watching this video or listening to this video um it doesn't have to be that way it does not it absolutely does not and that's that's some of the stuff that i hear in jordan peterson's talks uh, that being brave and forthright and honest and you know all those things that uh, a boy scout is is taught to be all those things can really exist in one person what i wish they would tell you of course is that it makes you a target and it also makes you uh, if if you don't have humility blended well within it uh, and and if you're not grounded um it can lead to you being a target and and of course uh, finally um a, a uh, involuntary martyr, <laughs> uh, which is never good. Uh, if you're going to be a martyr, you want to you want to do walk into that consciously and aware of things. It it's much more effective. So, but um, you get control of the narrative. But uh, but uh, yeah. So some of those things came up this morning, and uh, um, I made a post on Facebook about. Um, I saw this article about. Uh, some kid in Michigan or some shit like that, some place like that, um, brought down like a 600 pound elk. And I was just like, ugh, that's so gross. Like, like, it's like, you know, bringing down a, 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 a thousand pound cow, you know, a dairy cow. It's like, are you proud of yourself? <laughs> it's like, what's the point? Um, I don't understand that. And so I made a post on Facebook that said that I realized that Field and Stream uh, magazine is is the full metal jacket of periodicals. Uh, that um, you know I I I want to travel to new locations. The Emerald of the of the uh, was it the Emerald of the of the Asia or something like that. I forget the lines in Full Metal Jacket. Uh, I want to meet new and interesting people and kill them. You know. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, I want to venture out into the woods and commune with nature and then kill it. Like that just makes no sense to me. And then, of course, I followed up with um, that. I realized that, um, well, if you did make a magazine about just being one with nature and with God and with the universe, that nobody would really buy that magazine because it's, you know, those people don't have money. So <laughs> they just want the magazine for free. 
Uh, so again, there, there's always balance and there's always, um, you know, what you can do versus what you want to do versus what, you know, society will not allow you to do. So, but to back to my, uh, my homework basically for the, uh, the letter that I got to write to the, the judge to explain why Lauren, uh, my niece does what well, is not, uh, is trying to punish me right is trying to teach me a lesson um and of course the lesson that she's teaching me is that i didn't call her a cunt but she's certainly acting like one and um and by withholding her love and uh not allowing me to experience joy with my my, my littlest niece everly um she, she's not punishing me at all she's punishing herself and she's punishing everly so, because like I said before, like, I, I can't wait to have that meeting with the judge. Typically something like this, you don't have an open court. You just have it in the judge's chambers. And, uh, you know, I would love for them to bring in Everly and then Everly's reaction to seeing me, but she, she cannot help it. She, she would, um, she'd probably immediately ball up into tears, uh, of overwhelming joy. And I realize now that both her mom and of course her sisters could never evoke that kind of uh, emotion or reaction in Everly. And that's because they don't listen to her. They don't listen to Everly. I, I realized when we had her th that uh, I'm old enough now and mature enough now to, to understand the kind of language that children speak, which is, it's not in words. And that, that goes, you know, all the way up to adults. I, I have higher standards on adults, and sometimes adults don't like that. But with a child, you can, you can communicate so many more things through comedy and play and um, uh, affection than you, than you can with words. Because they, they don't have the vocabulary. You know, even most adults don't have that vocabulary. And, and, and an example is my other niece, Lauren, who is in charge of her right now. She doesn't have the vocabulary to talk about how um, uh, disappointed she is in me that I pointed out that, you know, if she's going to be a boss bitch, uh, she needs to, uh, you know, which is really being the authority. You need to act like the authority. Otherwise I'm going to clown you and I'm going to ridicule you because you, and I, I was talking to Sherry about this, about if you're, if you're the authority, right. And this goes back to being, you know, whether it's my father, my father-in-law, the police, politicians, whatever it is, you better be coming out with things out of your ass that I have never seen before, that I've never heard before, and that I can't argue with, if you're going to be the authority in society or your hierarchy or whatever it is. But if you're coming out with stuff that I can see right through, and I know it's bullshit, and I know you're full of shit, and you're just being a pompous jerk, I'm going to call you out on it. And I'm not afraid of you. And I'm not afraid of, of uh, sacrificing you know, what, what weird relationship you had with me in the, in the, in the first place. You know, like it's weird because the relationship that my father-in-law and my, I guess she's my stepmother-in-law have is, is wealth. They have wealth and, and because they have it, they think that they're right. And what's sad is that that's the only thing that they use in order to justify their authority. It's not morality. It's not logic. It's not you know, common sense or anything like that. It's, you know, if you don't do what I say, we're going to cut you out of the will. And somehow I'm supposed to respect that and, or even fear that like it's, that's gross to me. That's kind of sad in many ways that that's that let's say they're the king, right? Cause that's what my father-in-law likes to call himself. His name is David. So he calls himself King David. Of course he jokes about it as if he's joking, but you know, you really know that he means it. So, but let's say the king acts in that way, you know, how are you going to have any respect for that king? The king is not novel. The king is not unique. He's just another jerk with money. And the sad part is that David didn't earn any of that money. She did. So she has a, a, a six figure retirement because she worked for, you know, she worked for General Dyn Dynamics, helping, helping kill, kill people in a foreign place. <laughs> <laughs> making Americans have the, the best technology in order to do that, you know, and they, they compensate those people very well. And that's what she's been done. She's been compensated for that work. 
Um, what's what's really funny is when I talk to people that used to work with her and they're just like, oh, I'm glad that bitch is gone. So <laughs> she was such a bitch and she was so mean. And so like I, I, I was kind of relieved in many ways when I would hear these people's testimony because it wasn't just me. She wasn't just that way with me. So <laughs> it was it was it was kind of great, you know, but of, of course, in her in her mind, uh, she thinks about her mother, the way that her mother criticized her and was, you know, like that with her. And uh, again, she feels sorry for herself. My mother-in-law feels sorry for herself and, and, and feels like she needs to inflict that on the rest of us. And of course she doesn't. So just like my father abused me and my mother abused me, but I don't need to inflict those things on my children or, or in this case, Everly. Um, that, that's completely um, inappropriate and just gross and sad. And so back to my um, communications with Everly was that, you know, it's weird in society that you're not allowed to be yourself. And I think that's one of the sentiments that Sherry came up with this morning where Sherry confessed to me that she was, she was jealous that I'm able to be, of course, I'm not able to be my full self around everybody. That's, that would be really inappropriate. And, and that's why a lot of times I only save that stuff for you guys here. But, um, uh, she, she invited Sherry, my wife, uh, invited me out to uh, a lunch or I think it's a brunch date or something like that with a friend that she a co-worker she, she had from a while, a while back. And I felt like Sherry was wanting to bring me along for entertainment and just sort of conversation because I'm very good now in social situations. I, for a while, I didn't I didn't understand how to use my powers for good. And so I would just use them for myself. And I realize now that I can. Excuse me, bring levity to a situation and and really remark on something without being too controversial. If I if I want, I can I, I realized I'm 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 better controlling in my powers now. And a lot of that came through doing stand up and just performing in front of people and also reading reading the room um and just reading the audience on what they respond to. So that was another thing that came up this morning was um uh some some you know I went to that comedy show a couple of weeks back and um, it was terrible. And, uh, you know, I told a couple of people about it and some people said, well, why don't you go up there and show them? And I go, that's the problem is that none of those people appreciate good comedy. So, you know, like when you go to a, a Bill Burr show and you talk to the audience members, those audience members were willing to pay money to see Bill, even if it means, you know, like, or even like, like those, <laughs> it's that uh, chubby, weird, uh, daughter and her mother in the audience of the Chappelle um, <laughs> show. <laughs> um, you know, those people are willing to pay to have Chappelle make fun of them, you know, and that's that's a different type of audience member. Typically, the only audiences here are the ones eating chicken strips in a uh, adult um, video game arcade. I was going to say adult video arcade, but that's a different arcade. Uh, that's a different type of fun. Um, but, um, you know, e e you know, eating French fries and, you know, drinking beer and having that kind of, uh, you know, hillbilly night out and, and, and those people don't appreciate me. And that's one of the things that I'm very grateful for. I, dude, I hit over 4,100 subscribers. Thanks to you guys. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And I'd much rather perform for 4,100 people every day than, uh, you know, 30, shitty people in a club or a bar somewhere, you know, that are just like, Oh, there's a comedy show going on. Oh, okay. You know, like, like that. So I really appreciate, um, you guys and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that you appreciate me and, uh, I'm glad we can meet here, uh, virtually. And it, it allows me to get into everybody's home and phone and just be with you in a way that I, I hope brings you confidence and joy and, uh, excitement about, not just speakers, not just stereo shit, but, but in life. Um, and, and for me, that's what I'm really grateful for. Cause I, you know, when I look around, I look at all this stuff and I was telling Sherry about this this morning about, you know, um, when I met Sherry, that's when my life really began. And I really had focus about what I want in life. And, and I realized that Sherry was my ticket to the life that I had been dreaming about, but I could in under the thumb of my family, I could never be me. I could never really be who I wanted to be. 
And, and, and it's not their, their fault. They, don't, they don't, didn't know any better, and it wasn't conscious of them. They just, they just found me to be a threat to them, which I wasn't, but they just, it, it, it seemed like a threat to them. And so, um, I, of, of course, I had to escape them and, and that life in order to learn how to be myself and learn how to create something in this world that uh, facilitates the kind of things that I, I want to do with my life. And I, and I hope I bring that to you because, fuck, dude, if, if I can do it, I, anybody can do it. Um, it just takes time, and there's certain principles that that help. I don't want to say you have to follow, but they certainly help. One of them is to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop feeling sorry for yourself for the position that you're in. Stop feeling, uh, you know, poor me. And it, and it shows up in a bunch of weird places that you wouldn't even expect. And and my my mentor George Dare talked about this when I when I discovered it. I when I when I realized how everywhere it is in society. And how fully accepted it, it, it is. There's how can you possibly escape it? It's it's ridiculous. And and I and I when I realized that self pity is everywhere, my 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 mentor he said uh, it's the plague of humanity. It's the thing that can crush us at any moment if we submit to it. And uh, and it, and again, it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be just a king and his subjects. There can be something different. And sometimes it requires you to do it in a way that is, I want to say, untraditional. I, want to, I don't want to say illegal. I don't want to say, you know, fight the power, all that kind of stuff. That, that does not ever pay off. Um, but if you're, well, watch, the, watch the movie um, Cool Hand Luke. Number one for that car washing scene, that is amazing and that is classic and that is gratuitous and exciting and to think that that was shown in I think it's the late 60s when that movie was released in a theater with your kids and your wife is fucking great uh it's one of the great moments in cinema but the 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 point of the movie is about sacrifice and submission and that sometimes in order to get what you want in order to be who you really want to be in life it requires you to act uh in a way that society wants you to act. You know, gay people, all my gay friends know this. And I, and I, I just, I want to burst into tears thinking about uh, the way that they've been treated and the, and the way that they've had to live their lives in order to, in order just to get married, <laughs> in order just to have health care. I, I don't wish that on anybody. And, and and when people still persecute, whether you're gay or black or Mexican or Asian or a woman or whatever it is, that's unacceptable. And it, and, and it sucks. And it really does suck that sometimes you just have to grin and bear it and move on. And you have to be calm and uh, just shut, shut the fuck up sometimes. So I had a dream this morning. That's a good example of this. Uh, I won't get too much into the dream because it, it's one of those dreams that I had that was fully formed as a, as a Netflix episode. <laughs> it even had the logo at the end, the Netflix logo, which was great. The little uh, bumper, as they call it. Um, so, but there's a, there's a moment, uh, in the dream where, of course, I'm the main character and, uh, there, we're on this, um, we're in this, I guess, a van, like a people mover type of situation. And we're in California and it's, it's not supposed to take place in Disneyland, but the idea is that it takes place in Disneyland. And so we're all sitting on the tram or whatever it is, and, and we're trying to get where we're going. And then all of a sudden some, some loco vatos, some crazy gangster guys, come down the aisle and they know that there's a 10 minute window where there's no stops and they have, you know, they can basically rob and abuse everyone in those 10 minutes. And it, you know, and they threaten you with, you know, if you say anything that, you know, they'll kill you or whatever you and something like that. So, but, um, one of the, the, the bandits, um, I think does something to a woman and, uh, you know, of course inappropriate. And, uh, the guy next to me, like, lunges like he's gonna you know do something and I and I and I grab him 
and I publicly embarrass him by saying, hey, man, you need to let this guy do his fucking job. You, you, he, he doesn't come to your job and tell you what to do, right? So you, this is his work. This is his job. You need to respect his authority and help him out. And I, of course, I say that out loud so that he hears, the bandit hears the joke as well. And the bandit's like, okay, I like you. So that, that puts me in very good uh, candidacy to be house nigger so that I can keep the other slaves in line while he treats me better. And of course, the idea of this is to simply gain his trust so that then I can, uh, you know, in, in finale to betray him. And so, um, I, again, I don't want to get into the episode. I also don't want to ruin it because, but it was, it was, I, I love having these dreams where I was like, wow, that was a great episode in a TV show. And, uh, I can write all the dialogue and, and, and know all the characters and I know who I can cast and, and who I can even do as a backup cast, um, in case the, the primaries don't want to do it or, or aren't available. So, but anyways, the, the, the idea, though, is that I was able, in the, in the dream and in that situation, I was able to use comedy uh, as an icebreaker and also as a way to um, <sighs> infect uh, the, the threat. So, and, I, and I tell you this because um, it goes back to that, the, the, you know, the police interaction that I had the other night. The, the, the best thing that I could have said to that policeman was what I told you earlier, uh, to let him know that you know, his abuse of authority undermines all authority, not just his and not just the police, but all police, you know, because when, you know, the cards are down, they all stick together and it's a, it's a terrible thing sometimes. So, but the best thing that you can do is be good and just sort of, you know, not do anything until you can get inside and infect that motherfucker and kill them or at least create some sort of weird, you know, change or something like that. That's revolutionary. And, and for me, the, the epitome of that is somebody like Elon Musk, where um, luckily he's been um, ingratiated with enough trust, and that trust shows up in the form of dollars. Uh, and he's using those that trust to create some real solutions for people and humanity and society. And I think he truly believes that life can be better if you just allow it. And you have to overcome a lot of the resistance of of the corruption that the the, the corruption uh, the resistance that the corruption puts up so like right now he's having trouble getting the berlin gigafactory going and then all of a sudden there's this pivot where they merge basically they're merging with toyota or at least it's in talks or whatever it is right now and that's a much smarter move uh, again what it does is it, it, it doesn't leave a, 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 a if he if he hadn't done it he would have had more on the plate for himself you know, or Tesla's interest or whatever, because he's not, Elon is definitely not about himself. And he, and I think he's come to a real, realization about that. That actually makes him more powerful and also more dangerous when he's not greedy and, and selfish like other, other billionaires. So, but when you, all of a sudden you cut somebody in like Toyota, number one, that gives Toyota a leg up above the other uh, slaves, <laughs> the other uh, um, people that, um, harvest us that harvest citizens and harvest people that need transportation reliable quality trans safe transportation um and i think toyota has the right spirit um they have they kind of lost their way in the last couple of years but i think uh with this merger with uh tesla they'll be able to number one create much better products for society which is what i think the core spirit of what toyota has always preached in the, in the you know decades for decades and has wanted for their people and for the world is, is the same. And that's what makes it really good. Uh, the other thing is that Toyota already has factories all around the world. And so it's easier to just take over a factory that already exists than to build this big Giga factory that fucking Berlin and the European Union are, are basically gouging him and drowning him with in order to just sap him dry and test him and just, you know, line their pockets. And it's really gross and disgusting the way that they're doing it. But that's the way the system is right now. And again, what he needs to do is just kind of shut the fuck up, pay the money that they want. But this was a really great pivot for him to be able to do this. And, you know, I, I wish people would do more about this, about look at the reasons why business decisions like this get made. It's not always what it seems on the surface. A lot of times it's for something else. Uh, that goes back to when I was a kid, uh, Iran Contra, right? 
So the way that Reagan did it, and, and it's, it's so funny to hear Republicans and just idiots in general talk about, like, like Trump, idiots like that, talk about how Reagan was this, you know, super guy. He was, a, he was an idiot actor who was fulfilling the dreams of, of the in, industrial complex. And one of the ways that they got around the problem was that they were, um, how, how, what were they doing? They were, they were building the airport in uh, Iraq at the time, uh, as Iran, or wherever, wherever it was, Iran-Contra. But they, they, were, they were overpaying for the services that they were getting. And so you, you can watch the whole video with Oliver North and all that kind of stuff and, and the way that the CIA was working on it and things like that. So, uh, but, you know, again, it's nothing, very rarely is anything ever what it really seems on the surface. And so you, you got to look at it and see what, what, what's really going on, what's, what's really happening. And I, I do that with products. So, like, I do this, like... Like this, right here. So this is something you can relate to. Sorry, I don't mean to get too esoteric on you guys, and it's not that I mean to do that. It's just that I want you to realize that this stuff goes everywhere. It starts from the plate in front of you to uh, billions of, of people all over the world. So for me, I do the same thing with this. So I, so I go, why would Alpine go through the, the, the process of tooling up something shitty like this, this little skeleton of a subwoofer? Why would they do that when a polycone works just as well? And so then you go, well, why would they use two spiders? And why would, it, why would they only put leads on one side? You know? And then so you, you start seeing why they have to see. Look at the stitching. It's all on all four sides. Why would they do that? It's to match the limitations that the stitching does on one side. So that way you don't get rocking. So it balances it. But the problem is, is if they had designed this correctly in the first place, they wouldn't have to do that anyway. So, and then some, some of the stuff is like go fast features, meaning it's, it's just like, a, you know, sometimes they put buttons in cars that's like, it gives the people something to push, it gives them something, some, something to, f to feel empowered about when it's really just a bullshit button. And so, you know, for, for Alpine, that's, does this look great? Yes. Is this surround awesome? Sure. Uh, does it wear out real easy? Yes. Do they use shitty glue on the surround uh, uh, to the frame? Yes, and it comes apart. They, they only care that this thing sells, oh God, it sold for like $650. And then uh, it's only made to last a year. It's insane. So it, what, it, what it really is, is a ripoff. <laughs> That's, and, and what's funny is it's not even a ripoff for Alpine. They, they share the corruption with the retailer. The retailer actually makes more money than uh, Alpine. The, the margins are greater. So, and, and a lot of times for the retailer, they don't even have to put up their own money. They just have to have the store and the distribution ability in order to do this. And a lot of times Alpine will, will float them. They'll say, we'll give you, you know, uh, net 30, net 60, even net 180, uh, from what I was hearing about, uh, Orion and PPI and stuff like that. So that means you get the product for six months without having to pay a dime. And then if you don't like it, if you don't want to, you know, it doesn't sell, then you send it back. That's, that's a huge uh, guarantee. That's a huge bet uh, that they're making. But when the whole fucking woofer costs under 20 to $30 to make, you know, and you're selling it, uh, you're, you're selling it to wholesalers for, let's say, um, $150, right? So now you're turning $30 into $150 times a million. That's a lot of money really quick. And it's all legal. And it's... Uh, you know, it's not like cocaine, but there's an article that I was reading about the, the, the financials of cocaine and the way that, you know, like there's that boss, you know, we're watching also like, uh, what is it called? Narcos on Netflix about how like the boss in, in Colombia, the money that he makes in refining the, the coca leaves into the, you know, cocaine or even the, 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 the I forget what the name of it is. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a base. It's like a, the the cocaine needs to be refined even more. And uh, of course, if you watch uh, Queen of the South, there's an episode where she talks about the the purest cocaine is refined with ether, which is very expensive. But the process is worth it because what you end up with is, is a really really pure product, and then you can sell that for a premium on the market. So, but anyways, the, the I I find the uh, economics of industries like that fascinating, and that. You know, a company like this, like Alpine, 
was able to pull this shit off. And then what's funny is to hear consumers yearn <laughs> and cry out for products like this. Like, oh, they don't make the Tybex anymore, man. That was fucking great. It was a great product, blah, blah, blah. And it's a piece of shit. It's a piece of garbage that completely fooled you. And what's what's even funnier is that if if the product sold, if the product was great the way that it is, why didn't they keep making it? Right? Why didn't they keep making it? You look at somebody like JL Audio, right? They've been making the W7 the same way for like 30 years. <laughs> and the only thing they do is raise the price on it and then paint the frame a different color. That's the only thing they've done. That's the only, uh, I don't even call them improvements. That's the only changes they've made to that product in like 30 years. And uh, I, it doesn't make me respect them anymore, but it, it shows you that it, it works and the, the, the reps that sell JL Audio love it because they make their points on it. They, it's, they, when, when I, when I, back in the old days when I was trying to get my woofers into like local shops and stuff like that, I thought that, uh, you know, the margins that I was providing them were fantastic. You know, what I didn't realize was how stupid consumers are. Um, one of the guys talked about how people will come in and ask for JL and they'll just have too much money. You know, like they just, they're like, Oh, my grandma died and left me three grand. And you know, I figured I could get a stereo system. What do you got for three grand? You know, and the, and the guy's eyes just light up and he's like, Oh, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to buy a boat with this money or whatever he's going to do with it. There's so many horrors I could buy with that money. <laughs> uh, and it becomes this weird relationship between the brand, uh, and the retailer uh and it's a it's a marriage made in hell that that is fueled by stupidity of consumers and so that's one of the things again it doesn't have to be like that life does not have to be that uh gross and uh abusive and to harvest your hard-earned work. And I, and I encourage you guys, that's why I, I, that's why I pull all these products apart, to show you how simple it is and, and to show you that stop paying so much for it. You know, I, I'll, I'll probably only be happy when they're buying this for $30 and they're selling it consumer direct for about $60 to $80. That's probably when I'll be happy. And even then I'll still be working on something else that, that helps shave that margin down. And w when you do that, what happens is you eliminate a lot of the competition, a lot of the fluff. And so that's why somebody like, uh, oh, I don't want to name names, but some, whatever, some generic brand you never heard of is really just some guy that, you know, got a new high limit on his Amex card and he, he bought a bunch of stuff from Alibaba, puts his name on it and, and imports it. Right. So, uh, it eliminates a lot of those guys. So, but, um, and it's, and it's not that eliminating them is bad. It's just that it's, it's just, I don't know. It's a process. It's a process and it takes time. And, and again, I looked at the, how Elon Musk has done it with, with Tesla. And basically, if you, if you build a better product and, you, and you're able to sell it for cheaper, you win. That's how you win. And, and it's, it's, it's one person at a time. It's one idea at a time. And, and uh, that's how you can change things. And so going back to my life personally, that's one of the things that I coach my wife on, Sherry on, is because she gets overwhelmed really easy, especially with this this drop in health that she's had because of COVID. Uh, she, you know, she can't move like she used to be. She'll probably be disabled for the rest of her life, and it's, that's not something <sighs> that people look forward to. You know what I'm saying? So, and she's doing her best not to, you know, feel uh, depressed. You know, I, I don't want to say suicidal because she hasn't talked about any of that. So, but, um, just, you know, it's not a great future to look forward to. And I, and I'm, I'm constantly bugging her that you certainly don't want to look at it that way. And one way not to look at it is to look at all the freedom that you have in order to change your life in other ways. So yes, you can't do the things that you can physically do anymore, but mentally and spiritually, you can, you can do other things that you haven't made time for and that you haven't really reached for yet. And, and She's incredibly lonely. And um, for a while there, there was a, a bit of a blame on me for sort of tainting all of her, her relationships. And I, and I assured her that, 
you know, when I, especially when I look at my family, I go, none of those, none of those relationships were worth having. They were all abusive and they were all based on you being a good person. And all those relationships were just like leeches on you and just sapping your strength. And, and you were doing your best to, to, to want to be loved by them. But the price for, for being loved by them, it's, it's so conditional and it's so loaded. And even when you meet the threshold that they've, they've set for you, it's, it, they never deliver. They never deliver on the promise because if they do, there's no more game. There's no more way to leverage you. There's no more carrot for you to chase. And so, um, I know some of you are thinking about the carrot in my butthole and that's fine. I, 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 that's how your brain works. That's, that's just, you know, it works better than Google and that's how things work. So, but, um, I'll, I'll end at that. I got, I got some, uh, stuff I got to finish up for big perm. Uh, he's coming by tomorrow and I got to have his dumpers ready. So, and, uh, uh, some other stuff, but, um, shit, it's been 40 minutes and I love you guys. Take care of yourself and just remember to take little steps. Always have goals, you know, and it doesn't hurt to have big goals. You may not want to advertise those. Um, and a final moment that I've, I, a revelation that I've had on myself whenever I joined the air force and I moved to Hawaii and, uh, I came home to visit cause you know, you get Island fever when you move there, or at least I did. Uh, and I came home and I started talking about some of my dreams about having my own recording studio, about making movies, about, you know, just doing a lot of the things. My brother thought that I had been brainwashed. And he was he started to get really kind of angry with me. Uh, and of course, it, it, it got sidetracked because he made a joke about me because I came home and I knew some DOS instructions and I started poking on the old 286 that my mom had paid three grand for. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to retrieve some of my files and I, I realized that the family had erased a lot of my stories and a lot of my poems and things that I'd written in high school in order to make room for their, uh, what's that, uh, Commander Keen and, and video games and things like that. Um, it was, Bean, was it Bean with Bacon spacecraft or something like that? Anyways, but my brother was like, you know, that's when he declared that I was a nerd. He's like, you're a nerd. And I go, what? no, 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 I'm not a nerd. I'm cool, I'm cool. And he's like, no, you're a nerd. He's like, you know, computer languages. And I'm like, oh shit, he's right. So, but you know, it's okay to be a nerd. It's okay for people to put labels on you, whether it's, it's gay or queer or black or whatever you think is bad in society is it is not. Remember you're just a minority. Now the future is wide open and uh, it's not about revenge. It's about just being yourself and being able to, uh, just live, live a fucking normal life right now. You're seeing black people get into fucking Dragon Ball Z and all kinds of nerd shit. And it's hilarious. I think it was that guy in Texas that used those COVID funds to buy fucking Pokemon cards. <laughs> That's hilarious. That what it shows is that there's no difference between crazy people. <laughs> there's no color difference between crazy people. When, when humans get too much privilege, too much allowance, too much uh, you know, excess, they blow it on stupid shit all the time. So w the lesson there is don't be foolish like that. Don't be an idiot. So learn the, 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 the highest version of white people is, is like super cool. And, you know, I, again, you get kind of weird into like snobby things, you know, like, Oh, you, Oh, you have the, I remember reading this article about, uh, um, this, this, uh, yuppie had finally earned up enough money uh, working for a dot com to to buy a Mercedes station wagon, and it ended up costing them like three times the money that they made because it, it gets you into these um, it gets you into these circles with other people where that's that's you know a Mercedes top of the line station wagon is like a a shitty Honda, you know it's it gets you into these other worlds and stuff like that. So um, again, the goal is not to, to be in those shitty circles. The goal is to be yourself and have your time back and, and own the things that you really want to own, uh, and make important the things that you really want to make important. So I'll post some, uh, links to videos that I find inspirational. Um, um, what's his name? I want to say John Pena. Uh, I saw some stuff this week that was really good and some other, you know, little snippets or, or reels or whatever you call them, TikToks, uh, that I find great. So I love you guys. I'll talk to you later.